We did get some clarification from Amazon about what happened last week. Uh, as we'll know, uh, you you guys were talking about it on MacBreak Weekly before last week's Security Now podcast, and Amazon had a problem with S3. The details, I think, are really interesting. Um, Amazon, in their in their formal post action report said we'd like to give you some additional information about the service disruption that occurred in the northern virginia region on the morning of february 28th the amazon simple storage service s3 team was debugging an issue caused ca causing the s3 billing system to progress more slowly than expected okay so they were doing some maintenance at 9.37 a.m. Pacific time, an authorized S3 team member using an established playbook executed a command which was intended to remove a small number of servers for one of the S3 subsystems that is used by the S3 billing process. Unfortunately, one of the inputs to the command was entered incorrectly. <laughs> Pseudo I -E. RM dash RF star <laughs> something like that, right? Yeah, well, a typo. And a larger set of servers, and I apparently it was very much larger, uh, set of servers was removed than intended. So, you know, they have a, a command based sort of, you know, meta management system that manages this vast infrastructure. And so like, you know, rather than going over to servers and type talking to them individually, they just do something. And, you know, for example, I've seen that when, when GRC has been under attack and it's just like, okay, we're being blasted with ridiculous amounts of traffic. Um, I talk to level three and I say, okay, just black hole the IP. And so, you know, someone at a single console types a command and all of level three's routers at the, all of their borders cha update their routing tables to remove that IP. That's so the that power in, of BGP, right? I mean, we've seen right. people screw up BGP well, before. Right. But but it also typically and, and, and certainly this is the case with, with level three, they have their own. You know, they have they can't have that happen by mistake. That's got to be an audit trail. You have to have auth authorization to do that. So there, there's like a, a management layer on top. Yeah, they should never and have so, hired that guy from Price Waterhouse Cooper. That was <laughs> just because he was out of work. Come on. So, so Amazon says the servers that were inadvertently removed supported two other S3 subsystems. One of these subsystems, the index subsystem, whoops, that sounds important, manages, <laughs> <laughs> manages the metadata and location information of all S3 objects in the region. This subsystem is necessary to serve all get, list, put, and delete, which is, you know, pretty much everything, all the critical verbs for getting and putting, listing, and deleting stuff. The second subsystem, the placement subsystem, manages allocation of new storage, like where, does to, where, where should we put stuff, and requires the index subsystem to be functioning properly to correctly operate. The placement subsystem is used during put requests to allocate storage for new objects. Removing, they write, a significant portion of the capacity caused each of these systems to require a full restart. While these subsystems were being restarted, S3 was unable to service any requests. Other AWS services in the U.S. East region that rely on S3 for storage, including the S3 console, Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, that's EC2, new instance launches, Amazon Elastic Block Store, EBS volumes, 
when data was needed from an S3 snapshot and AWS Lambda were also impacted while the S3 APIs were unavailable. So, you know, Amazon's been building this system over time and they've been building it carefully. And it's, you know, it's sort of their new services are aggregated on top and use the older ones. And it happens that, you know, S3 was where this all began. This was, this is like the, the root core on top of which all these other things are built and depend. So Amazon says S3 subsystems are designed to support the removal or failure of significant capacity with little or no customer impact. We build our systems with the assumption that things will occasionally fail and we rely on the ability to remove and replace capacity as one of our core operational processes. While this is an operation that we have relied on to maintain our system since the launch of S3, we have not completely restarted the index subsystem or the placement subsystem in our larger regions for many years. S3 has experienced massive growth over the last several years in the process of restarting these services and running the necessary safety checks to validate the integrity of the metadata took longer than expected. So essentially, this is something that that they knew worked, but they hadn't done for a long time. And it sounds like it, they were surprised that it didn't that this was an, an area that wasn't scaling linearly. It was scaling more exponentially so that they, they went, oops, when they realized that they had inadvertently shut down much more of this than they expected. And they're not, they're not explaining why, but essentially it required a full restart. And then they were, they re realized with some chagrin that, oh, is it, is it restarting? It's like, well, yeah, it's trying. I mean, it is, but it turns out it, it like took way longer than they had expected. And it's something that they, they hadn't done for a long time. So they said the index subsystem was the first of the two affected subsystems that needed to be restarted. By 12.26 p.m. Pacific time, the index subsystem had activated enough capacity to begin servicing S3 get, list, and delete requests. But remember, not put, because that's the other thing. By 1.18 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, the index, the index subsystem was fully recovered and get, list, and delete APIs were functioning normally. The S3 put API also required the placement subsystem. And remember that that relies on the index subsystem, so that had to come later. The placement subsystem began recovery when the index subsystem, they write, was functional and finished recovery at 1.54 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. At this point, S3 was operating normally. Other AWS services that were impacted by this event began rec their recovery. Some of these services had accumulated a backlog of work during the S3 disruption and required additional time to fully recover. Anyway, I just think this is a fascinating look, and, and it goes on for anyone who wants more details. I'm not going to bother going into it here, but I have it all in the show notes. Um, just sort of an interesting look into the, 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 uh, the scale of this kind of system where, first of all, the design is cool. The idea that you know, and, and we know how redundant it is because, for example, you pay more for more redundancy and you pay less for lower redundancy. And and even so, you don't pay much. I, I use S3. It is my, as I've said before, it is my, my primary cloud-based backup system and every month I get a bill. I just keep pouring stuff into it. All the podcasts are archived there. Uh, lots of images of critical subsystems are, and systems are archived there. I get a bill for two bucks. It, it's incredible. I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing massive bandwidth transit I, because that's where you start to pay the bills, but it's $2 a month. And I think about all the, the, the huge amount of storage that I use. And it's it's incredibly robust, as we've seen, not not absolutely unable to fail. But I, I should just follow up and say that they this was a lesson for them. 
and they, as this post continues, they assure us that their many steps have been taken as a consequence of what they learned. It is no, it's no longer possible to enter that typo. There's much more oversight. Uh, there's another system that looks that like watches what, like what the impact will be and says, Whoa, wait a minute. Um, is this what you meant? And so there's like much more, uh, accident prevention so that the tool, which arguably was had become overly powerful. And this is one, another one of those things where over time, some, the, the very, like, like the, the birthing assumptions no longer really held, but no one had revisited them because there was other things to do, you know, forward progress and work. So anyway, just, uh, an interesting case study, I think for, for a, this kind of, this you know massive super enterprise scale and how it it operates how it's resilient and how it it gets managed I thought it, it was also really underscores the uh, just as cloud did last week the problems with a monoculture mm -hmm. wouldn't have been such a big deal except that everybody uses s3 yes and amazon web services That's exactly a very good point so yeah. suddenly wham um, you know, in fact, I just saw that because we'll be talking about an, an interesting site uh, viewer tool later. And I, I and someone sent me a link to it. I, I actually it was our friend uh, Simon Zarafa sent me a link that he had run a GRC against it, which is kind of a very boring, <laughs> boring response because, you know, it's a small GRC is a small site where I, and I I looked at their list of recently run uh, scans and and clicked on CNN and it was it was just like full of AWS stuff. I thought, ooh, CNN would have been impacted if you know if yeah. if there wasn't redundancy. 